So let's begin with a culture that is very near and dear to my heart, the ancient Etruscans. These were a people living in north central Italy prior to the Romans um, and then concurrent with the Romans and eventually the Romans overtook their land. This culture is so rich and beautiful and leaves behind such an amazing archaeological record, even if they didn't leave behind the same amount of writing, for example. There's no literary tradition in Etruria. There's uh, inscriptions and people's names and stuff, but that's about it. Even without written sources, we have so much that we can look at from the Etruscans that we really get a sense of who they were. So I'm really excited to uh, bring this material to you if it is, you know, your first time encountering it. The Etruscans celebrated funeral games, which would have been athletic competitions held uh, at some point during the funerary observances. And there is a theory that maybe this is where Roman gladiatorial combat comes from, um, but I'm not going to get into the debate about that. It also seems likely that banquets were held in honor of the dead um, on the day of their funeral or the, you know, the days of their funeral, perhaps on their birthday or the anniversary of their death, something like that. Now, I can't talk about the Etruscans without talking about the city that I worked in, beautiful Orvieto, which is in the region of Umbria in Italy. This is one of the most important Etruscan cities, if not the most important. There's a lot of archaeological sites in and around it. It has a big necropolis or cemetery that's located on like the downslope outside of the city. The city's on a plateau. Uh, and this is a, a huge site with all sorts of stuff that comes out of it, including um, inscriptions, and that's really exciting when we don't know the Etruscan language. It's huge. There's over 200 burials there. It was in use for centuries, and so that is one of the most exciting sites. I did not do archaeology at that site, but I have visited it and I, I learned about it while I was there. It's really, really cool. There's also mound burials in some of the hillside towns. This is a different style of burial, um, so you can see already there's a lot of variety. And uh, one thing that I want to point out, uh, in the museums, I remember, you know, my first few times going that what always stuck out to me were funerary objects, so things left in graves that have been excavated, that were broken. Um, not because they broke accidentally or just, you know, with time, but they were intentionally broken. Either because they were intended for the realm of the dead, this idea that things that are made for this world don't work the same way in the underworld or the, the afterworld, that they must be broken in some way, uh, or uh, a more practical explanation is that they were broken so as to render them useless in this world and therefore they would not be stolen from graves. So a religious and a practical explanation for that practice. But getting back to our purpose, uh, the type of funerary art that I want to show you from the Etruscan period and from the Etruscan region is tomb paintings. So Etruscan burials could be very elaborate and uh, some burials were set up like little houses with walls on the inside that would have been painted uh, pretty elaborately. And this of course was not for everybody but this was one of the um, practices that the Etruscans used as part of their funerary rituals, and it leaves behind some of the most exciting evidence uh, for how the Etruscans lived. So I'm going to present to you two examples of this, both from Tarquinia, which is the site maybe most famous for this kind of art, so the first one is called the Tomb of the Augurs, and it's so called because, as you can see by looking at the picture here, there are two figures that uh, were thought of when, you know, when archaeologists were first uncovering this material, they thought that these were augurs. They were reading bird flight for divinatory purposes. That's not the going theory anymore. 
but that is where the name of the Tomb of the Augurs comes from. So this tomb dates to the 6th century BCE, and it's one of the earliest um, depictions that we have of funerary customs. They're actually showing the customs that they're doing. They're giving us a picture, a literal picture of what they were practicing. So on the right wall, if you're looking at it from the entrance, um, you see more of these priest type figures making these gestures, uh, suggesting maybe that there was some sort of divination going on. There's lots of birds flying around. Um, and one of the figures, this guy right here next to the wrestlers, uh, is holding like a curved staff, which would have been one of the signs of uh, diviners or priests in Etruria, so that gives us a good indication of who he is. There's also a small figure on the side here, and then you have this curious figure, this seated person dressed in all black. The going theory is that this may actually be a depiction of the deceased, who in, interestingly enough, is wearing mourning clothing and is looking pretty bummed out to be missing all of the excitement of the funeral rites. And these would have been exciting times. Yes, they're sad, but they also would have been celebrations of life, if you want. Something akin to like a, a jazz funeral in New Orleans. Next to the two guys that look like they might be augers uh, are these two wrestlers. And these are representing the funeral games. And how beautifully are these preserved, right? This is just gorgeous, gorgeous material. So already, just by looking at one example of an Etruscan tomb painting, we have a representation of funeral games, possibly a depiction of the deceased. We have divination happening. There's a lot going on. Um, and the last thing I will say about this tomb is that typically, so this image that we're going back to is the far wall when you're looking at it from the entrance. So the one farthest away from the door and it has actually a door painted on it. This tomb is not the only example of this. The prevailing theory about this is that these are representations of the actual gateway, the, the door to the underworld. And when you get into some of the later material that I'm not gonna cover, there actually are like underworld divinities and demons that are painted like on the sides there instead of these augers. The other example from Etruria that I wanna show you is called the Tomb of the Leopards. This also comes from Tarquinia and it dates to the fifth century BCE. It's named, as you might have guessed, from the leopards that are depicted on the top of this back wall here. But right under the leopards, you see this totally awesome uh, image of this feast. So the figures are depicted the same as you would see in like attic pottery, where men are represented in red figure and women are represented in white figure. That is just to distinguish between the two. And it looks like a large crowd of people that are reclining on couches and enjoying this feast. Now, I mentioned that feasting might have probably was part of the Etruscans' funeral customs. So it may be the case that what we're looking at is a depiction of a funerary feast. It would be a suitable subject for a tomb, I think. Now, here's one of the side walls. This is the right side. And on it, you can see a lot of really uh, beautiful images. I'm just gonna say everything is beautiful because it is. I make no apologies, it's gorgeous. On the side here, you can see three figures, um, at least in this picture. This is not the whole wall, but this is who I wanna focus on. And I wanna start with the two on the right because they are very clearly and obviously playing musical instruments. So you can see from this tomb that the Etruscans had music, and in fact, it looked a lot like Greek music. On the right, you can see this is some kind of lyre or kithara. This would have been like a concert stringed instrument. Um, and then in the middle, the double reed pipe that you're looking at is called an aulos. And um, I'm, I'm gonna link some stuff below about ancient music. It's in the Greek context, but if you're interested, there's a lot to dig into with that. We know that 
Greece had contact with the Etruscans. We know that they traded a lot back and forth. The Etruscans had their own versions of stories from Greek mythology, for example. Um, so I'm not that surprised to see Greek music here, but it is just a, just a stunning depiction. Um, you don't often get stuff from antiquity preserved this well, so uh, I'm definitely geeking out about it and I love it. Um, and then the figure on the left-hand side, uh, next to the Owl Lost player, appears to be dancing. So we have music and dancing. These things naturally go together. They're also holding some kind of uh, vessel. This probably would have been like a drinking cup for wine. Um, and I think that this is related to the feast that we just saw in the first image here. So there's a feast that not only has food, but also wine and dancing and music. So you really get to flesh out what this funeral banquet would have looked like. So this tomb is very famous um, because of how vividly it paints Etruscan life. So much that D.H. Lawrence uh, wrote about this tomb specifically that they were, quote, a vivid, life-accepting people. Those are just two examples from Etruscan funerary uh, archaeology. There's so much more even beyond tomb painting uh, that you can look at. But even just by looking at these two tombs, you kind of feel like you know the Etruscans a little bit better. You see representations of things like funeral banquets and games, the door to the underworld perhaps, uh, references to religion, and I'm not even getting into how they're dressed and what they're wearing and how they're painted. There's all sorts of stuff you can tell about um, the Etruscans just from these two incredibly well-preserved tombs.